welcome to the show. Once again, we have a fabulous lineup of guests to energize and inspire you. It's time to wake up your wow with your host, international award-winning speaker, Kath Vincent. On the show, stand-up comedian Brendan Lovegrove on being politically incorrect. From hobby to thriving business, custom jewellery maker Lynn Fisher. Building resilience with HeartMath trainer Wayne Neal. Little pictures in the story of how it's meant to be. And in the Wild Records music slot with Jesse Wild, we hear original music from Simon Astley. All this and more to wake up your wow. Brendan Lovegrove, welcome, you're on the show. I am, hello. Hello. <laughs> nice to see you. You too. Hey, you're a stand-up comic. Mm. Well, sometimes on stage you are a bit kind of, uh, what's the word? In fact, how would you describe your routine? Um, Extremely. Tr extremely excellent. Yeah, and yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I know what you're trying to say. I know what you're trying to say. I I can be found. Um, I'm. Uh, what do you call it? Treading, treading. Um, offensive. Let's just say offensive. Yeah. Okay. Let's Some just come find, out and but to say. But I, I, I fortunately don't have to think about that too much because um, there's very little you can do in today's society anymore without being uh, live on stage without offending somebody. Well, we've gotten really politically correct, haven't well, we? We have, and it's a shame. I mean, I, I still remember the days when people said when you're a comedian, if you're not offending somebody, you're not doing your job. Yeah. And, um, but to be fair, you know, I could walk on stage and say, good evening, and someone would say, <gasps> can you please stop telling me what kind of night it is to say hi or hello, because it might be good evening for you, but it's not for me, and therefore I'm triggered, and where's my safe space? <laughs> you know, and it's, it's becoming that ridiculous. I think that especially when you're doing something like comedy, it's the last bastion of any art form where you, you can openly talk about any particular subject without any judgement. Yeah. And if you are saying something that's genuinely offensive, you'll know it because the crowd won't laugh because they don't go out to laugh at anything that would be considered racist or sexist or anything homophobic. They just don't. Yeah, so you would have a good gauge for, actually, is the audience with me on this? You know, is it just one yeah, person? Yeah, I, I mean, I, sometimes you have to take them on a little journey and also because... Um, I'm the comic and they're not. Yeah. I'm the one who's writing material to sort of take them on a, you know, I'm trying to be as original as possible, as original, and uh, they're not writing comedy, I am. So I am trying to take them through through little doors that perhaps haven't, they haven't walked through before and taking risks risks myself, you know. But, but, but hate speech these days, I find, or something like that, is not really so much... It's simply just that another person has another opinion and you hate it. Yeah. That's what I find hate speech has become. You obviously have a lot to say to the world. Do you think that's important? <laughs> Not being particularly funny, <laughs> am I? But, but, but it's important because I, I actually make jokes about this well, listen, to, to, listen, to make this people aware of it. And this know. isn't a stand-up comedy routine. No. Because obviously we could well, go and see you, you know, we could go and see you do comedy. Mm. And what we really wanted to, to do is to talk to the, the, you know, the man yes. behind the comic. Sure. Um, but listen, you know, when you're doing comedy, is it important, do you think, to be any good? Do you have to have a lot of strong opinions? Um, I think I've become that as I've got old because that's just particularly become what I've been interested in. Yeah. Um, I don't know. It's been a part of what I do. It's not all of what I do. For example, this year's uh, show is a lot about Donald Trump, and I find it's not even for or against. Yeah. It's just about Donald Trump. It's just topical. And, uh, and I'm doing a little bit about Kim Jong-un because I couldn't help but have this little... Uh, this little thought in my head that Kim Jong Jong Un is actually the max key of North Korea, because they're both, you know, sons of evil dictators. And uh, anyone gone down that route with it? Fingers crossed, it'll work, and no one from the national government will come. Anyway. And, and listen, lifestyle-wise, mm -hmm. like, what do you do to keep sharp? Well, I have a new PlayStation game, and uh, well, I, there's this new game, it's called Battlefield 1. It, have you ever played it? I can't no. recommend it enough. It's so yeah. violent, it's unbelievable. <laughs> but, but I also play this other one called, it's un, and the graphics are amazing, it's actually like there. But I play this other game called Street Fighter, yeah. and the graphics are so real that I was in a fight the other night in Hamilton, and a guy was punching me, and I just thought I was playing the game. So <laughs> I was on, pretending I was on, yeah. And he was punching me, and I thought I was on my handset, so I was going, defend, 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 but he was actually hitting me. And of course, I couldn't see him very well, because the graphics in Hamilton are appalling. You know, so... Uh, 
I love that gig. I think it's so good. No one ever laughs at it, and then two people go, "Yeah, that's funny." Because yeah, I've been to Hamilton, funny. and that's indeed funny. the graphics were appalling. Yeah. That, that was quite a good lesson in there's, comedy. There's there, a, I, I was just going to pick that up. Mm. There is a good lesson in comedy there. Mm. And actually, I think it's a lot more complicated than it it's really looks. Mathematical. I mean, it looks very kind of off the cuff, like, oh, I just came up with this stuff it, instantly. It, it, as soon as I see somebody who looks like they're really off the cuff, I know that they're, they're doing material, and it just looks as if they're doing it off the cuff, and they're probably very experienced. Yeah, but it's a big risk being on stage. Have you ever, like, bombed? Of course. Or... <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Not recently. Um, not, um, not, not like a real bomb, not for a long time. Just a but little bit. But I've had some tough a times. Mini bomb. A bombette. <laughs> well, if you buy a Vespa, you're going to come off at, at some stage. That's a, that's a guarantee. Yeah. If you, you know, even the, the best cricket players in the world, Sachin Tendulkar gets bowled for naught, yeah. but he's still the best batsman in the world. Um, I sort of look at it like that. And sometimes you actually don't, you don't always want to go well morally because you should be taking the kind of risks where where failure should be an option. Oh, I like that. That's, yeah, that's it's got motivational. To be. It, it, yeah, you should be saying things that people go, wow, I don't know where, if I should at all be going along with this, and then the, the, your, the risk would be losing them and then getting them back going, no, I understand what he's saying, this is actually very funny, because sometimes it happens a lot. Yeah, I love mm. what you're saying about risk. You should be a motivational speaker. <laughs> an offensive one, but... <laughs> <laughs> Oh, someone's told me that actually. Speechless. He went speechless. Well, there, I, did well, he pe people have said that, and um, you know, I just would find it slightly ironic that somebody who's led the life that I have would suddenly be in a position to motivate. Yeah. <laughs> There'd well, be people going, him, a motivator. He's, I see him on his bike every day without a helmet on Pont to be Road. Yeah. How's, uh, yeah. <laughs> well, you're a man of the people, that's what it you, is. Can I just tell you a quick story? Do, tell me a quick story. Real quick, because I can see something going. Yeah. yeah, I just ignore them, it's really cool. <laughs> I got pulled over on my, on my, on my bike without a helmet. <gasps> and, I got, and then this policeman came up and he said, um, he said, Brendan, you need to go home and, because he knew who I was, yeah. somebody had seen me in a show and he went, I'm just going to say this, I'm not going to, you need to go home and ask yourself some very serious, serious questions. And then I'm going to ring you on your mobile, which I've got, which you've just given me, and I'm going to ask you what you asked and what the answers were. Have you ever had anything like that? Uh, this not. policeman, and he rang me and he said, right, Brendan, you didn't wear a helmet, this is your phone call. What questions did you ask? And I said, well, you wanted serious questions. So my first question was, um, you know, have astronauts even been on the moon? <laughs> and um, who was the best batsman in the world? Is it is it Kane Williamson or is it Joe Root or is it, you know, the Indian guy? He's very good. And the other one was, is what would I want to be out of a policeman and a fireman? And he said, Brennan, do you realise what they all have common? in common? And I said, no. And he said, they all wear helmets. <laughs> So <laughs> that is the weakest <laughs> gig ever. That is the weakest gig ever, and I know that. But you know, sometimes you can't always take. That's not a risky gig. That's this nice little helmet gig, and and, and the children love it, and it's a family thing. That's, that's nice. a joke you could do on six thirty at te on television, that's nice. and seventy five year olds going, no, they do all wear helmets, and kids going, yeah, he said helmet, <laughs> and then you've got that broad demographic, and it's just great. Hey, thanks for joining us. Thanks on the for sofa. having me on the show. Thanks. Next up, do what you love and make a living. Lynn, welcome. Thank you. It's a real pleasure to be here. Now, you are a jewellery maker. And yes, you've, I am. You, it, it's not a hobby, it's now a full time yep, fashion. No, it's my, it's my business. I make pure silver jewellery. Yeah. And it's unique. It's not something you can buy 20 of in a, in a shop somewhere. Each piece is individually made. Yeah, so That's it's not manufactured, it's handcrafted. Yeah, absolutely. And how yeah. did you get into that? Um, I've made unique pieces since I was 18, using a little stub of candle that I'd carry around with me in, in the dark nights in Cornwall. <laughs> and I'd um, individually make bracelets for fellow students. And then I've been making silver jewellery for about 10 years, and that came about... I absolutely... I love Christmas, <laughs> and I was making... quite taking quite a while to make these little hearts. Yeah. And my friend, who was a jeweller, said, why don't you make them out of silver? And I'd had a, I had a practice with her before making various things out of silver. I was like, oh, that's a good idea. Um, they completely took off as baby's first ever Christmas decoration. Wow, that's I great hand idea. Because I can scribe names onto them. Um, they sold in a boutique shop in London, and then the shop owner said, you can't sell Christmas decorations <laughs> all year round. Why don't you make them into jewellery? And I was like great idea and then I've just 
carried on and never stopped. Yeah, so you were just off and running from that one idea. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. So listen, how did you scale from it being a hobby to it actually being a business? Um, a lot of hard work um, and just realising that it was a real passion yeah. and when something is a passion it's you know I quite often when I'm doing Instagram I do hashtag I love my job yeah. because yeah when you do something that you love you you can turn it into a business yeah you you do need to have days where you've got 90% perspiration and 10% inspiration that's part of having a business but what you put in you get out yeah so what advice would you give someone who's trying to turn a passion into a business and it's tough take help when it's offered oh yes yeah people i have an absolute army of mainly women behind me yeah that when i say sandy feet jewelry i'm not just talking about me i'm talking about a whole team of women yeah all very motivational <laughs> and you know passionate and we all nurture each other and you know so yeah um if somebody offers help take help and also pass it on someone helps you you help someone else it's yeah. yeah it's all about getting out there and helping everybody and then you'd be surprised you know you put out those good vibes yeah. into the world and and the universe gives them back as well so what is, what's your big, biggest challenge oh biggest challenge is um trying to have a work life balance it's not everyone's biggest challenge yeah it's really <laughs> hard i i do deal with that via quite meticulous planning yeah which i would um recommend to anybody is plan it really helps it really works yeah. um and yeah and do think about not just the work the life the life balance if you're ill you know if you're overworked you, you can't do your job so you do have to balance them and in everything that you've done, in all the pieces that you've made and the progress you've made to date, what are you most proud? Oh, most proud of? Um, yeah, I got you thinking, I, haven't yeah, I? <laughs> I love my commissions. I get commissions and they are heartfelt, beautiful pieces for different people for different reasons. So this is someone specifically saying, hey, I want you to make me something quite specific and quite yeah. unique. Yeah. So give us an example of how that works. Um, OK, I've got the example of um, a seagull's wing. Yeah. Now, if you go on the internet and look at wings, you've got angel wings, you've got lovely wings, you know, none of them are anything like a seagull's wing. Yeah. It's very specific. Um, I've got a, a single image that they've come up with and they want the seagull's wing because a seagull is strong um, They fly long distances and um, And that's very relevant for that person um, And then so I've got a rough idea of what they want. I've studied the you know anatomy of a seagull's wing Wow, um, yeah <laughs> Come up with different designs and then different ways that I could make it and then when I finally, you know, got what I think, I, and I love discussing it with the clients, that gets me out of the workshop, which is, which is great, you know, coffee or occasionally wine, that's yeah. nice. <laughs> um, yeah, so, so I get to talk, you know, with, with that person and create that special piece of jewellery that means so much to that person. Yeah, and what's next for you? Um, Actually, I've got a little present for you. <gasps> Thank you. <laughs> I, I want to make more of da 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 hidden, um, more of my jewellery. Now this one is. Oh my goodness! Thank you. Well, a little dicky bird told me <laughs> that you um, that's, that's right. oh, yeah, have been. Um, you rather like Buckland's Beach. Oh, that's beautiful. Um, and that is a shell. That's a real shell from Buckland's Beach. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh so I was up burning the midnight oil to make that one for you. Oh, that is gorgeous. <laughs> so that's, Thank you know, you. I make a, make pick, hand pick a real shell from the beach and I, I do that from local beaches and um, and then make them into a, into a piece of jewellery. Wow, so. I, I see, you know, you've demonstrated now exactly that principle that you're talking about where it's something really quite unique and very personal. Yeah. <laughs> you thought you'd like that. You. Oh, what a beautiful <laughs> present. Thank you so much. That's all right. You're very and welcome. Hey, and thank you for your words of advice and wisdom for business people everywhere, I think, yeah. on how to turn a, a hobby or a passion into something sustaining. Yes. So yeah. Th yeah. thank oh, you so much for being it. on the show. Oh, thank you for inviting me. It's been <laughs> lovely. It's wonderful here. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Next up, from survival to thrival. Wayne, welcome on the show. 
Thanks, Kath. It's been a while since I've seen you. And <laughs> We've been talking about this for a little while, haven't we? We have, yeah. So listen, you are a trainer and coach for HeartMath. Yes. Tell us what HeartMath is. HeartMath is an organisation that has brought the science and heart-based living together. So the science around the heart is it does a lot more things than just pump blood. Yeah. It actually has its own brain and it sends information to our brain, more information up to the brain than the other way around. Right, so actually listening to your heart is really more important than listening to your head. Very much so. Psychologists say that 70% of our, neg of our talk yeah. in our head is negative. Yeah. Yet from our heart, it's all positive. Oh, you know, interesting. I hadn't mm. really thought about it that way. But yeah, you're not in your heart going, usually. Well, heart's about passion. It's about things you enjoy doing. Yeah. It's not about, oh, this is not working for me. That's head engaging. Interesting. Mm. So how does HeartMath help us? HeartMath helps in the way that, A, we give you some science to understand what goes on and how our bodies work and how we function on a day-to-day -day basis. It looks at our emotions. Yeah. And our emotions send information to our brain. And if we're in a negative emotional state, it sends a, a mixed message to the brain. It's kind of like driving a car. You've got your accelerator yep. and you've got your brake. Right. And there's an automatic, autonomic nervous system that sends the information from the heart to the brain. And if we're in a negative state, we've got both feet on both pedals at the same time. Oh, right. Yeah. So, so you're burning up energy, you're not yeah. thinking clearly, yeah. the engine's breaking down, the body's breaking down, the energy's not there, so you don't have the energy to get yourself through the day. And people know this because you get, have a stressful day where you get home, you're absolutely knackered and you just want to veg out. Yeah. But you've got all these things to do. Yeah. So we're constantly on this treadmill of negative emotion, driving and burning up all our energy. So how yeah. do we not have both feet on both pedals, like counter, counterproductively? How do we not do that? The bre it's all around our breathing. Right. Because when we're stressed, we tend to breathe very, very shallow. Yes. And that sends that message to our brain. When we slow our breathing down and regulate it so we breathe in for the same amount of time in and out, as I breathe okay. in, my sympathetic nervous system speeds up my heart rate. Yes. As I breathe out, it slows it down. Do you know, as you do that, <laughs> you're actually controlling my breathing. Yeah. I actually felt that. <laughs> and that's exactly what happens. And, and the neat thing about what we're doing here is I can teach three to five-year-olds these techniques. Yeah. And it's really useful for them, and I'll get back to that in a moment, about the Dunedin longitudinal study, as well as Navy SEALs and the Dutch police. Yeah. Uh, many police forces are now using these techniques because they are in high-stress situations all the time. So, so these people who are in a high-stress situation, more, more high-stress than just the normal every day, are using breathing techniques so that they can recover more quickly? Or what, what's the outcome? It's all about resilience. Most people talk about resilience as our ability to bounce back. Yes. What we teach is we teach you how to prepare for an event, regulate your emotions during the event, and then replenishing after the event. So we're actually maintaining a stable set of emotions throughout, even though we're highly stressed. Okay, so to use your driving analogy, mm -hmm. it's a bit like keeping your fuel tank steady rather than letting it just plummet and then be driving around going, oh, I'm going to run out of fuel. Well, if you, I remember my grandmother, she was a surge driver, you know, in her 80s, she was still driving around Christchurch. Good on her. And down Colombo <laughs> Street, which is the main street of Christchurch, and she'd sort of accelerate as she got to the intersection and go through the green lights, and then she'd take a foot off the accelerator, and then she'd accelerate through to the next one. And this is the way my grandmother sort of drove her car. It was like, oh, well, it's green, so it's green, so I'm off. Yeah. And away I go. And then she'll back off, back off. Is it going to change? It's going, no, it's not going to change. Off, and yeah. off I go again. And that's how we live our life, yeah. with stress. We're allowing our stresses to really burn our energy. All the, it's a constant energy burn. And what we're trying to do is teach people how to regulate yeah. so that they're not burning that energy. So can you really regulate your stress just by breathing. I yes. mean, it sounds, it sounds so incredibly easy. Mm. It's almost too easy. To, people will think it's too easy to be true. And that's why I run workshops and teach people about this, because I give them the experiential, but I also give them the science so they actually understand it. Yeah. Now, you mentioned that, you know, the Navy and firefighters and all sorts of people are using this. How are they using that in their work? Well, if you could imagine, if you're under, under fire, for example, or a police like officer, yeah, yeah. or a police officer dealing with a um, home, home invasion or home violence, yeah. we've done some research with police officers 
Before they go into their home violence situation, their heart rate may be 70. Mm -hmm. When they engage, it can go from 140 to 190. Right. Just standing still. This is just the stress of being in that conflict drill environment. Yeah. Then after that, what they know is that police officers take the best police officers would regulate back to normal functionality in an hour and 20 minutes. But many took as long as six hours. Right, OK. But this is just in training. Yeah, and actually, you know, and I guess this is true, even if, it's, even if you're not a firefighter or a policeman or whatever, even the ordinary stresses in every day, we have a heightened response and it may take a while to get over it. Yeah. In fact, there's a um, Dr Dorian Dugmore, one of the UK's leading cardiologists, he, did the, he couldn't believe the results that we were getting at HeartMath, so he did his own tests. Yeah. And he got couples in a car, put them in a town in England that they didn't know, and gave them a map and told them you've got oh half God. an hour to get from point A to point B. <laughs> How many divorces? <laughs> <laughs> what was really good, though, is they put ECGs on them so they could measure the heart rates. Yeah. What was fascinating was that women regulated back to their normal within two hours of the event. Right. Guys typically took more than six hours. Really? So this six hours seems to be the time it takes for a male to regulate and stabilise his emotions. So this is chemistry or biology or whatever all mixed up together? Yeah, and a bit of physics there as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't a science major, I have to tell you. <laughs> no, nor was I really, but it's come part of my life now because now I realise the relativity of it. One thing I really wanted to ask you, it's not about trying to live in states that are lower key. Like you can have high energy states, but still be stress free, can't you? It's not, heart rate variability is not about being smooth and flat and, and just totally calm. Yeah, because that, that's really not me. Like it's totally yeah. calm, it's never gonna be me. <laughs> but you can be really angry, <laughs> or you can be really excited. And they both have a similar heart rate, you know, that pumps the blood through. Yeah. But one of them's pumping DHEA yeah. and oxytocin, and the other one's pumping through cortisol, depending on our emotional state. And so tell me, what are you excited about right now? <laughs> <laughs> I'm excited about I'm excited about the youth of today. I think they are fantastic. There's just some great things happening amongst the youth today. Um, I'm launching a preschool parenting workshop at the moment and I'm just running it locally in my area in, in East Auckland at the moment but I hope to get uh, expanded out further where I'm teaching parents about emotions and the science behind emotions and we also have an online book for three to five year olds teaching children how to learn about emotions, emotional languages and recognising emotions. And just getting into it much younger, that's yeah. basically it. Well know? there's a Dunedin longitudinal study which is world famous and in that study, they've been studying children that were born in 1972. I think there's 1,036 participants. Oh. And they've been following them all their lives. It's the most world-renowned um, study on human nature. And in that study, they identified the key to success is the child's ability to self-regulate between three to five. Emotional control. Wow, that's huge. Isn't it? Mm. And, that, and they show that they have greater success in relationships, better quality health, and more success in life. Yeah, do you know that doesn't surprise me at all because teachers do tell you that they can see in three and five year olds, you know, they know where those kids are headed. You yeah, know? literally. Yeah. And I've got the science to support that stuff. Okay, well that's obviously going to have a huge impact on the world. That's my dream. <laughs> <laughs> well listen, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thanks for the invite, Kath. Much appreciated. Lovely to see you again. Next up, the Wild Records music slot with Jesse Wilde. Jesse Wild, welcome back. Great to be here. How are things? What are you up to? Oh, I'm working hard. Lots of recording really? in the studio. Really? Yeah. <laughs> Doing a bit of construction upstairs in our home. Uh, and tell me, who's recording in the studio right now? We have Simon Astley all the way from Tasmania. From Tasmania? Very international. How did you find him? Well, I didn't actually. He found us. Ooh, famous. That's exciting. So the word's obviously getting out there. Yeah, I'd say so. So season one, I remember combing the streets, looking all the nightclubs and bars. Yeah, looking you were for in the musicians. bars a lot, yeah. That was my excuse anyway, <laughs> looking for musicians. But now they're starting to find us, which is great. Brilliant. And he's in the studio right now. He is. Let's have a look. Let's do it. Times. The 
childhood days when we'd play hide and seek in the garden. Bright blue summer, cold wine was day. Change of house and change of heart. This is how it's meant to be. Black and white faded photos, color the walls and the memories. Reminiscing out the times of a childhood day. Little pictures tell the story of how it's meant to be. Little pictures tell the story of you and me. Little pictures tell the story of how it's meant to be. Little pictures tell the story of you and me. Tell the story of how it's meant to be. Little pictures tell the story of you and me. Little pictures tell the story of how it's meant to be. Little pictures tell the story. Stuff. That was great. Thank you. Mwah, Thank you. Loved it. Loved it. Thank loved you. it. I am a big fan of keyboard, though. I have to say, I really yeah, love it's that. Fun, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. that's my first instrument. So, yeah. Since what age? Uh, seven, I think it was. Mum put me on the piano, and oh, actually, I think she actually know. put me on the piano. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good age to start learning. Yeah. So you've joined us all the way from Tasmania. I have. And flown you've flown all the way. Yes. Especially, especially yeah. to be here. Yeah. Well, my arms a bit sore, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Because when I think of Tasmania, I always think of the Tasmanian Devil. Yes. Well, funny you say that, actually. Um, I wrote a song especially for Save the Tasmanian Devil Appeal, which is um, to, to help save the Tasmanian Devils. Yeah, so that people can download the song on iTunes um, and all the money raised goes to Save the Tasmanian Devil Appeal to help the devils. So they have a tumour, um, face tumour, so they, they bite each other. A, a face tumour? Yeah, a so tumor they, when they face. bite each other, there's a, a face tumour, so it's called DFTD. Um, and so basically they, they um, yeah, they're, they're killing themselves, unfortunately. So we're saving money for, for a vaccination to help, help um, when cool. they do bite each other. Great, so what's that song called again? Uh, it's called Save the Tassie Devil. Okay, yeah. so you can Excellent. download Save the Tassie Devil and you will be doing your bit for the wildlife. Yes. And what are you working on right now? I'm uh, working on a single that um, I'm going to re be releasing soon, so nearly finished recording with that. And then an album, probably a, um, going to do a, um, what do you call it, a, like a, 
um, unplugged yeah. version, I suppose, or unrest no. version of um, yeah. probably just piano vocal um, as well. Um, so, yeah. Stripped back. Stripped back. Yeah, I won't be stripped. I won't be stripped back. <laughs> probably best to get your clothes on. Well, I actually could. And this from could Jesse. Back in the, uh, I could be stripped back when I record it, no one would know, would they? Yeah. Whatever well, makes you, you feel yeah, good. Yeah, exactly. Do you know yeah. what we have the naked chef? You know, we have yeah, the yeah. naked musician. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm looking forward to hearing it. Yeah, yeah I'm you. looking forward to seeing it. No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, thank you so much for flying in, Speffy. Yeah, thank you it's very been much. A, it's a great, great pleasure having yeah. you yeah. on thank the you. show. Thanks for being on the show. My thanks to all my special guests, to Brendan, to Lynn, to Wayne, to Simon, and of course, our very own Jesse Wilde. And until next time, don't wait to wake up your wow. We don't usually oh. clap. Do we clap after that? We actually don't, but let's clap now anyway. <laughs> All right. Brilliant. Woo!